Who's wrong and who's wronger? In this corner, followed by Millions James, the exploding unicorn, Breakwell. And in that corner, ignored by Millions, Steve Dodge, Rinko Levi. Everybody and welcome back to the Thanksgiving Giving Thanks episode of Wrong and Wronger. I am the thankful, or the host that you are the most thankful for. I almost screwed that up. I'm certainly not thankful for my co-host, but thankful to the three of you. Dr. Steve, Steve Olivas, and he is James the Thankless, Ingrate, Breakwell, and James... Man, how are you doing today? I am spectacular now that you actually showed up at your own time. You're like ah. a wizard. You arrive exactly when you intend to, which is never when the rest of the world expects you. But we're on what? Steve time now. So please lead us into this episode. <laughs> Every time we do this during my work day, we start at five minutes after the hour. Usually I tell you that. I figured, ah, this time surely he'll do the math. But no. James Breakwell whining in my inbox. Are you going to be here? If today? you if you I'm told me twelve oh five, you'd be here at twelve ten. Like you used to be oh the God. man on the minute. Now you're the man on the whatever. <laughs> I just you just. I, but I, I guess it makes sense. We were talking about beforehand about how you put me on your schedule, and you said you wrote me on your schedule, like with an actual pen and paper. Like this is like two thousand BC. So I assume you're oh keeping track God. of time on a sundial. So you're inaccuracy should be forgiven uh this and many other reasons are why i will only be thankful regarding this show for the fact that it is a mere 25 minutes long and not a minute longer i i couldn't stand this any more than 25 minutes james you remember in our glory days it was only 15 minutes long i mean you <laughs> you must really miss that time of our lives it was probably when we were at our best because we had those extra 10 minutes to not enjoy each other's company hmm why did we even stumble? Like, did we plan it to be 50? Like, 10 minutes to save your marriage, the time frame is built right into the title. Why did we arrive at 15 and then expand to 25? Was there a, a, a conversation about that? At one time, I think we thought we had enough stuff to talk about. And it turns out we have, we can talk, but we don't have stuff to talk about. Those are two distinctly different things. But arguing about topics, I don't think we had enough time in 15 minutes because I just had so much information about why you were wrong that it, you know, I was being strangled by that shorter time limit. And now I guess there's so much going wrong in your life that we really need the full 25 minutes to get into that. Oh, yes. Very little that I am thankful for. But I don't have the charmed life of James Breakwell to get up. And you probably bounce out of bed every morning, James, with a song in your heart and a spring in your step. I, uh, I do a barrel roll out of bed. I'm so excited to start the day. I just can't wait, uh, except on podcast recording days where, you know, I've got that dark cloud hanging over me. But every other part of my life is perfect because unlike you, I didn't sell my house and move into a garage so that I could one day move on to a <laughs> rattlesnake blue branch. So that I am thankful that I am not you. That's probably number one on my thankful list. And my number two on my thankful list is for our hotspot demographics where we are, you know, climbing up the charts. What was, we were in South Korea. We're like number 66 among English language self-help podcasts. And that's that's for our other one, 10 Minutes to Save Your Marriage. Wrong and wronger yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. ranked anywhere, of course. And then what was the – there was a country in Africa, and the name escapes me right now. And I, I should really be thankful for them, and I can't even remember which one it is. Uh, Uganda. Uganda, that's what it is. Yeah. I, yeah so uh, thank you, Uganda, for – Number two. Uh, for your, number two. For your one listener who listened to us shooting us up to number two. <laughs> An English language self-help podcast. You guys rock. James, I am thankful for a story you told a while ago because it lit a fire under me to deal with a contractor differently than I may have otherwise. Oh. You played a role in this and then Mrs. Steve saying, you have to do something now. <laughs> that had a little bit to do with it also. But we had a Breakwellian type of situation on our ranch in that we had mostly good contractors and one flagrant pothead <laughs> that was unmotivated to do anything. So he'd show up and not do anything for however long. And the, the, the benefit that I had in pushing the right button was that we agreed on a price ahead of time. Mm. So it wasn't like he was getting paid hourly. So 
as this project is stretching out further and further and further, and Mrs. Steve uh, finally saying you have to do something, and remembering James Breakwell's story of firing a contractor, I sort of went halfway with it. And I said, here's the deal. Uh, you're going to get this done tonight, or I'm going to start docking your pay $200 a day starting tomorrow. And I, no more... No. Uh, promises, no more reasons this isn't finished. And I'll be darned, James, he finished during the night. He, I think he probably <laughs> stayed all night to get it done, but there you go. Now, mind you, that's uh, that's not enforceable in any way. You can't, uh, you know, you didn't have a contract for the penalty, but you could just refuse to pay, you know. it's. Did you do that sure. thing where you paid half up front and half when you finish? Nope. No, nope. you didn't give him any nope. money ahead of time. I had all the power. Ooh, I had all the power. That That is a good thing. I don't know. I, I don't get contractors who do that, who just stall and dilly-dally. Cause it's like you're not getting paid. It's not like yeah. you're an hourly worker on the clock slacking off. Like, I get that. You're collecting the money whether you do something or not. But these guys who only get paid if they do the work, it's like you are literally only hurting yourself. But uh you know what? I'm not a contractor, so I guess I'll just never understand their world. They they probably have some higher rationale that I just can't uh, I can't wrap my head around. Wait a minute! You sort of threw me a minute ago. Are did do you did you pay your guys half up front? Yeah, every contractor uh, I've ever dealt with, it's always you pay half up front and half upon completion. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, zero of the ones we've dealt with. And our concrete guy has been pouring for us for almost a month. And finally, he said to my wife, could could I have 15 grand? I've been paying for all this concrete out of pocket. And she's like, yeah. So we gave him 15,000 bucks and we'll just settle up with him when he's done next week. But he didn't ask for anything up front. Well, and the other contractors we've had, same thing. Well, I mean, like, small individual jobs, like, you know, plumbing, electrical, all that kind of stuff. When I had those guys do my brickwork and back, I always paid for that after the fact. Uh, but, like, any time we've done a big, major renovation, and I take that back. The, the biggest one, it wasn't half up front, but there was, like, a down payment. Then you paid as you went. And the smaller one, I think, yeah, it was. Uh, we paid half up front, and then we were supposed to pay half at the end. And uh, he never got that one at the end. So <laughs> luckily, every time, you know, every time we did that, we came out ahead like the one guy. So we, you know, he had like 1% of the project left to do. And by not finishing it, he missed out on like 15% of the money. And this other guy, he probably got 60% of the project done and he got, you know, 50% of the money. So he definitely would have come out ahead had he finished. But uh, that's contractor math for you. Yeah, I don't understand it, but... Uh, whatever. Why don't we, we the form a tiled. contractor business, Steve? Just me and you. We have no idea what we're doing, but we're going to show up on time and we will do the job. It might not be the best quality, but it will be done and we will be millionaires. We will be the only contractors in the history of the world to show up when we say we are going to show up and to finish projects on time. I actually, we have one of those Whoa. that I can't remember if I ever talked about, but I've, she's been very popular on Twitter. Mrs. Steve hired a 21-year-old girl from town to be like her helper. Mm -hmm. And uh, that girl, I'll be, she shows up on time every day. She works her ass off and she, she smiles like she's got a good attitude. And I further found out, James, she drives a stick, she, she drives a, an, a manual transmission car. Like, I just want to hug her parents. I don't know what they did right, but she is unlike any other worker I've ever dealt with. So the bad news is the secret cabal of contractor is, is they're going to find her and they're going to corrupt her. I mean, that's how this story <laughs> ends. I'm sure at some point all contractors were young and idealistic, showing up and smiling and actually, you know, working. And then the other ones get in there and they're like, what do you think you're doing? My, uh... I had a professor in college who told a story like that. He said that uh, w over a summer break or something, or while he was in grad school, one or the other, he took a job as a postal carrier to make some money. And it was a really easy job. And he could do a route that was supposed to take like eight hours in one or two hours. And the other mailman got on him. He's like, what are you doing? You're going to make us all speed up. You're making us all look bad. So he would go and deliver some of the mail and then take like four or five hours off 
and then do the rest of the mail and arrive at the right time. Now, I think they've since gotten wise to that. Because I know when I had the newspaper route as a kid, there was one time when there was a mail carrier going around. And there was a guy following him, like, counting the steps. Like They, they have, like, accountability people, I believe, who follow wow. them to figure out how long these routes actually take. So that's why <laughs> you should never get one of those jobs because they actually, you know, check whether or not you're slacking. So, again, there are certain fields where slacking is allowed. There are certain fields where slacking is not allowed and apparently mail carrier is one of them where it is definitely not allowed contractor not only is it allowed but it's encouraged I, it, it's almost a necessity i would like, say you mandatory. have to have that yeah it's, mandatory is the word i'm looking for thank you english major yes <laughs> mandatory is part of the job so i I, I don't know. I can't see this happening to her, but uh, I will feel devastated when, if and when it ever does. So I guess we're thankful for the one contractor who does show up. I have no contractors to be thankful for, but I'll go ahead and throw something else out there. I am thankful for my quiet house. Right now, everybody else is out of the house <laughs> going to school or work or wherever else. So I have complete silence to sit here and talk to you. Now, it is a shame oh. that I am squandering this wonderful productive, oh. uh, productive opportunity on this podcast. But the fact is this opportunity exists because my family is far away. And for that distance, uh. I am thankful. Boy, those days where you can pee with the door open. Like, uh, that's how I judge whether or not it's a good day. Well, you've got your kids out of the house now. Like, those have got to be coming more and more often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although Mrs. Steve has been laid up for a month and uh, never really leaves the house. And not that that stops me one way or the other, but... <laughs> Are, yeah. No, our son is home this week. Oh, so are you? I have to wear pants like it's a weird thing. And I have to I close the door when I pee now. It's it's very strange having another person in your home. Is he home in a garage somewhere or is he home yes. at the cabin? No, no. We were so we were going to move into the cabin. <laughs> but for this contractor who did not finish the shower, only one of the showers works, and we needed to get it tiled so that the water doesn't go everywhere and into the wall again. And he couldn't get it tiled in a week. Like a, I don't know, two-day job. Took seven days and the threat of withholding money for him to finish it. So we were going to have the cabins this week, but instead we had to throw my son's <laughs> mattress on the floor in the garage. And that's where he has been sleeping. Your poor son, he probably only came home on break under the promise that you would have an actual dwelling for him. He didn't expect to be homeless. And you just lure him in and then give him a mattress on a garage floor. He's going to have such stories to tell his friends when he gets back to hockey boarding school. Like, I can't imagine oh, a yeah. different world than, than that a more diverse uh a more diverse setting to go from hockey boarding school to mattress on the garage floor but you know what you could spin this you could you could make really give him a guilt trip say son we we spent everything every last penny on your education and now you owe it back to us you got to go make this money and you got to take care of your parents now so feel free to use that one you know, all he has to do is explain to his friends that his dad spends a good chunk of a day talking to James Breakwell, and they'll all understand immediately why we're living in a garage. How long are your days that this is a good chunk of it? Uh, my days, James, it is almost bedtime. <laughs> I, I can't believe that people are still awake at this hour. I haven't eaten my supper yet, but I'm sure I will soon, and then toddle off to bed. My day, my day is truncated. I, I mock you, but I was up till 1040 last night and I'm feeling it. Like I, I transitioned at some point where I, I tried this wild thing where I was going to start sleeping for eight hours a night, which I hadn't done in like a decade. And yeah. uh, it was amazing. It changed my life. It you know, devastated my productivity, but I felt so much better. And then late here lately, I've uh, gotten busy again and I've cut it back to seven or six hours a night. And suddenly I feel like death. And it's like, oh, I guess this is just how I always used to feel. <laughs> so uh, so I kind of bounce them back and forth between those two worlds. And I can't I can't decide which one I want to live in. So I guess I'll just put a toe in both. Do you really, are you able to sleep eight hours a night? No. Like consistently? I, well, it, it depends. I mean, I, I come close, but usually I'll wake up. Uh, if, I, if I get too much sleep, then I'll wake up in the middle of the night. Then I'll wake up, uh, you know, a little early. Uh, it just depends. But yeah, if I, if I get tired enough, I can sleep close to eight hours, like seven and a half, 7.45, somewhere in there. Wow. Well, I, th I don't know if I could. I'll drop a nine or a 10 once in a while on the weekends, like every few months. But if I had... 
all the time in the world to sleep, I would still not be able to sleep eight hours every night. I think I'm figuring out that my issue is I have a, a cap. Like, I really can't. I mean, if, I, if I'm as tired as possible, I can sleep till about seven, and that's it. And uh, I think it just doesn't matter if I go to bed at 8 o'clock or if I go to bed at, like, 2 a.m., I'm going to wake up at 7. And the, so that's, that's the hitch. I can't think, oh, I'll be, I'll, I'll be up at 3 a.m. tonight and I'll just sleep in on a Saturday. It's not going to work. I'll be, up at 3 I'll be up at 7 anyway and just run it on four hours sleep. What is magical about 7 o'clock? I don't know. I think there's daylight. And I think there's something in my brain that says I need to be out hunting and providing and doing all those things that I have no skills at whatsoever. <laughs> the, the caveman part of my brain is still there and just messing up everything in my life. <laughs> you got to come out to my house next November and we'll hunt. Yes, I, uh, I've i got that bow. I've practiced with it all of once this year, but I I definitely want to do that. And uh, do you have trail cams? or Actually, do, do you hunt at all? I've never asked you about that. No, I, I'm going to learn myself. I'm interested in learning. So this is the worst possible way we can learn. So you should always go out with somebody more experienced and say, we'll just get two total amateurs together. <laughs> we'll get out <laughs> well, there. And we're going to come well, in. And uh, we'll see which of us shoots wait. the other one with a bow and arrow. We'll have a guide, like a... There are plenty of people out there who are good at it that would love to come on the property to hunt. And my father-in-law is an expert hunter, oh. and he would certainly supervise us also. But no, I, I am looking forward to learning the uh, art, craft, I don't even know, skill. My dad was a big hunter back in the day, with a, not never with a compound bow, which is what I got. I, I like a compound bow because I can keep it in the house. I don't have to worry about the kids. If they find a gun, that could be trouble. If they find a compound yeah. bow, you know how hard it is to kill yourself with a compound bow? <laughs> like, if you pull that I, off, you probably deserve it. I mean, <laughs> I can't even imagine the logistics. It's like a 70-pound pull, and yeah, anyway. I can it, suffer a heart attack while pulling back on the thing. Does that count? Yeah, maybe that, or maybe if you, like, trip and fall on an arrow just right. I mean, it, it would <laughs> it would have to be a real freak accident but my dad uh he had a, a shotgun and a rifle and he's he's 14 years younger than his only sister so he basically grew up an only child in the woods and he would run yeah. around with that 22 and once it, the, raccoon pelts used to be worth something i mean raccoons are were not always the garbage animal they are today at one point they were kind of a fashion statement so he went he said it was like 50 bucks a pelt and this was back in the day when they oh. could buy like a car for a dollar or whatever whatever <laughs> <laughs> inflation in there. Yeah. inflation has changed since then so he went out one summer and just massacred raccoons <laughs> and at, he was like buffalo bill <laughs> there, there were no raccoons left in that corner of iowa uh but then he took all the money and he just spent it on another gun and it's like wait a minute it's uh i don't, I don't know that you really came out ahead on that and he uh and so and he used to hunt deer too and uh he said his uh he, the final time he went hunting it was in the winter or you know it was iowa so maybe it was just late fall and there was a foot of snow on the ground because that's just the way northern iowa works and uh, he saw this this big deer out in the open field and he had a clear shot and all i could think to himself was if i shoot that thing i've got to go out there and gut it and drag it back in the cold and i kind of just like to go inside and so he did not shoot that deer <laughs> and that was the end of his hunting days i think that's your your signal as a hunter when your your desire for meat is is uh less strong than your desire to just go inside and, and not be in the great outdoors well, that's a very logical point to stop. I like that re that reasoning. Yeah, his other uh, his other big famous story. There's he's got a couple that are going to live on past him, and it, th those ones probably won't make the cut. But the the one. Uh... Well, there's two. One of them I can't say on here without getting canceled. But the other one. Uh, hey, it's deplatformed now. Uh, deplatformed. Wh whatever it answer. is, it would not. Uh, yeah. yeah, that it would, my family finds the story hilarious. But yeah, we can't repeat it in <laughs> polite company. But <laughs> it sounds like I'd find it hilarious too. The, but the other story is that uh, my dad and my grandpa they they shot a deer. One of them got it, and they came back in, and the meat locker was going to close pretty soon. And for some reason, they had it hanging up in a shed and they want they wanted to get it split before they took it over to the meat locker and uh they were in a hurry and so rather than trying to split it with a knife they thought well we've got a chainsaw sitting right there let's try to oh, saw God. a deer carcass in half with the chainsaw if you think about how you know if you give it like more than a half second of thought that they gave it you think about how <laughs> chains work I mean, that is going to, it's just going to gunk all up and make a horrific mess, and which is exactly what it did. He said it looked like a scene from Deliverance, just deer chunks <laughs> and stuff 
everywhere. I think that shed was torn down by the next owner, probably because they could never get the deer blood off of everything. Needless to say, a chainsaw is not a, an effective way to split anything in half, despite the horror movies you might have seen. Wow. The more you know. Yeah, there you go. The more you, you, know. you did not expect this podcast today to be educational. You came here to be thankful. No, no. Be thankful that I am here to teach you these life lessons. Life Lessons by James Breakwell. There's another podcast idea for you, James. <laughs> Just don't do what I did. That would be a more accurate description. <laughs> yeah, I would bet most hunters have stories like that because uh, you mix a little bit of alcohol with a whole bunch of dudes getting together and marching through the woods without their wives and girlfriends. Like, there's bound to be some hijinks at some point. Yeah, I mean, I can see the appeal. Not that I like outside, but just imagine you get to be alone, <laughs> away from your family, like and you get to kill something at the end of it. I mean, just and then you get a drink. What's what's not to like? I the older I get, the more the more I see the appeal. No, the appeal of hunting or the appeal of outside. Oh, not the appeal of outside. <laughs> Maybe just the appeal of not being inside. We need we need a third place that's not inside with everybody else, but also isn't outside. Maybe just a second inside location where I can be by myself, a bunker somewhere, perhaps. Maybe that's what I really want. <laughs> well, now we're full circle back to your quiet house and all that you are thankful for. Yes, but I've I have taken up most of this time being thankful for everything because I'm such an effusive and a thankful person, but what are you thankful for? I am thankful, well, <laughs> I am thankful that eventually this house will get done and we'll be able to move. But I will say on a more serious note, I am thankful because we cannot, I think you even asked me once on the show, Mrs. Steve and I cannot piece together how we stumbled upon this property, but I the the conversation was that we will never sell this place because you cannot reproduce what we have. It's an amazing mix of wooded and prairie and it's got hills and valleys and two ponds and it's it's stunning. It's amazing. And I I don't know how we got it, but I am thankful that we were able to not only find it but also be the high bid because the thing sat unsold for almost three years and yet it's strange james the week we put our offer in nay the day we put our offer in the realtor said she got two other offers it's weird how that works you do realize that these situations where an abandoned house basically finds you are always the setup for a horror story like this is how every ghost yeah. story starts i wasn't even looking for this house and the listing book blew open or i got the mysterious <laughs> email from a realtor long since dead and we just had to buy the property and now there you are in the middle of all the all the the body lubricants and and horse sex parts and rattlesnakes and just, just living the dream Oh, James, by the way, the sex toy, we did. I talked to the concrete guy. The sex toy is going to be entombed in our back deck. He mixed it in with the gravel. So he's pouring concrete over the whole thing. And that sucker will be a part of that ranch forever and ever. Amen. So he, he made the, like, he made the deliberate choice to toss it in there. He yes. thought this porch, this porch needs this ingredient. Yes, yes, we had talked about the significance of finding it. And he was just like, okay, okay. So, <laughs> so he's not... <laughs> did you look out there when he poured it to see if maybe part of it was sticking through? If there's a little piece of pink visible? <laughs> That's, there's no guarantee it mixed to the bottom. It could be at the surface somewhere. Hopefully in full <laughs> no, profile mixed... so everyone knows what it is. <laughs> You got to uh, put like a gravel base and then concrete over it, oh, and it's in the gravel, okay. so it can't stick up. But that's a great idea. I wish I, you know, people sometimes put their handprint in the concrete. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, and this is why, on second thought, I will never be visiting your ranch. <laughs> yes, I have a bar relief of my genitals in the concrete. <laughs> Do you remember when you were all hot and bothered about closing for this house? You were down to the second. We've got to get it. We've got to get it right now. It's such a rush. Yeah, and you finally got yeah. the thing. And it's like a year and a half later, and you still haven't moved in. No, but it has gotten better and better, which is exciting to watch. Nothing is done, which is strange. Not a single project has been tied up or buttoned up. 
Like the garage still doesn't have doors. The door guy was supposed to call me yesterday and lo and behold, he did not. Shocking. The tile and the shower is not done. The extra bedroom is just like, a, it's just particle board now. We, we Like it's not done. Nothing is done. One shower doesn't work. There's no electricity in the garage. Like everything is moving. It looks different. We still have a little bit of concrete to pour. That's not quite done yet because the weather hasn't cooperated. But when things start getting done, it's going to be awesome. I thought... The good news, James, the good news is we are absolutely flat broke right now. We are literally out of money. Wow. And so everything will halt. All of this mayhem will stop for a while and then just go slow at Mrs. Steve's pace as she gets to be able to walk again and then start working this stuff to the end. So while you're working this stuff to the end, at what point do you actually move into the midst of the chaos? We would have moved in if the shower would have been done. Now that the shower is going to be done, we will be moving in probably, I'm guessing next weekend. I'm not sure what our schedule is, but we'll start moving stuff in immediately. I thought I thought uh, pot contractor guy already finished the tile. He did. It's got a little grouting to do, uh, which I'm not sure if Mrs. Steve is going to fire him and then give him a sound beating and do the grout herself <laughs> or just change the order a little bit of those three operations. Gotcha. All right. Well, I, for one, am thankful that the chaos is not over yet. I, for a while, I was afraid you'd get your act together. We wouldn't have any content for our podcast, but I guess there's really <laughs> no danger of that. So you just keep doing you and I will be thankful for all of that. Until we meet again after Thanksgiving, I will have gained seven pounds. Breakwell will have lost three. That's the way my life goes. But this is your favorite podcast co-host, Steve Olivas, Dr. Steve, with the guy you barely, marginally tolerate, James the Exploding Unicorn Breakwell, saying thank you, thankful, thankful, grateful for watching and viewing and telling a friend, hitting that subscribe and like button. And until we meet again, two wrongs can make a right.